You know I've been talking about earned media value for quite some time on this podcast. My friends at Eisenberg have just raised the bar on earned media benchmarks with their social index. Social Index now gives you globally earned media values across a growing list of six geographies for all your KPIs across the top seven social platforms, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. You can now visualize these values for deeper analysis, and they have a look-back window over two years of historical comparisons. Social Index is updated daily. Don't get stuck with old data. Over 1,000 companies have used the social index to understand the ROI of their social campaigns. And if you work with a social agency, you should demand they incorporate earned media values into your reports. Get your earned media value for social content. Visit earnedmediavalues.com slash Allen. Again, that's earnedmediavalues.com slash A-L-A-N. If you're a marketer or business owner, you already know TV advertising is a powerful channel for business growth. It's also a solution for businesses frustrated by digital marketing's rising cost. But the traditional process for launching TV campaigns is expensive, time-consuming, and complex. Marketing Architects believes brands deserve access to quality TV campaigns. That's why they flipped the traditional TV agency model on its head to create all-inclusive, TV. With all-inclusive TV advertising, marketing architects invest their own money to produce, analyze, and optimize your TV campaign. All you pay for is media. This means you get top-tier solutions for every piece of your campaign, but without the dramatic price tag, setting you up for rapid growth at an extreme cost advantage. In fact, all-inclusive TV is so revolutionary, they wrote a book about it. If you're a marketer, business leader, or interested in the TV advertising industry, you'll want to grab a copy of All Inclusive TV, How Booming Brands Are Reimagining TV Advertising. Read how other brands use TV to transform their businesses and how you can do the same. Go to marketingarchitects.com slash book to get your free copy today. Again, that's marketingarchitects.com slash book. For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Ricky Engelberg. He's the Executive Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer at Vista. Vista is the marketing partner to millions of small businesses around the world. And as CMO, he oversees all things marketing, customer experience, and digital product. Ricky joined Vista in September of 2019 after almost two decades at Nike and Converse, helping them drive the creation of things like Nike Plus, the Nike Plus Fuel Band, and the Connected Product. We also talk about his early career and education at the University of Georgia, go dogs, and how Athens and the music scene, the entertainment scene, and the work he was doing at the university with student media and sports all played an early role in shaping how he sees the world and, and frankly, his entire career forward. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Ricky Engelberg. Well, Ricky, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, Great to be here today. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation. And I want to start with this interesting fact about you. I hear you've already had an early advertising career as a kid. Tell me and the listeners a little bit more about that. I grew up in Orlando, and Orlando is a unique place to grow up, particularly in the early to mid-90s, and that opened as part of Universal Studios there. And when you were watching Nickelodeon game shows, like one out of two of the game shows contestants were just from local schools in Orlando. And so it'd be all of my classmates when us and myself would go and be on game shows like Nick Arcade or Get the Picture. So I was 12 years old on Get the Picture and the first square comes up. It's like a puzzle guessing game, a picture of a guessing game. And it's a baseball glove. And I answered, is it a baseball glove? And got it right, won $75 from getting that right. 
the problem was my answer got put into a poll quote as a commercial that aired for Nickelodeon for basically the rest of my childhood. So probably until I was around 20, Nickelodeon was running a commercial. So I had a sixth grader, seventh graders coming to be like, is it a baseball glove? And so that commercial just aired over and simultaneous to that, tying into the baseball theme, my AAU baseball team was very good. And we won back-to-back national championships. And our coach was this guy, Tom Amansky, who also made instructional baseball videos. And we all would star in the videos. We'd be in the commercial for them. And he aired them, oh, literally 25,000 plus times on ESPN into my career at Nike. To the point where I'd be sitting in meetings at Nike, ESPN would be on the background and you'd see a 12-year-old me hitting a home run. And while sitting at a meeting with the VP of US marketing, I'd be like, I'm about to hit a home run right here. But yeah, the back-to-back-to-back AAU national champions was the commercial that I was in all the time until probably age 13 until probably 25 or so. I also can blame my mom that we received no royalties from those. I don't think SAG was involved with those. And from Nick Arcade, I ended up with 15,000 Dum Dum Pops, I think was my big prize, and literally had Dum Dum Pops for probably three years, like just a never ending supply of them. You can find my game show somewhere on the internet still as people send it to me from time to time. (laughs) That's hilarious. I think, unfortunately, it wasn't a very profitable career, but you've probably had one of the longest running advertising careers I've talked to anyone about. (laughs) Yeah, it's it was nothing like having your 12 year old self have a 10 year run, but in a very targeted way, game shows and sports. So besides as a 12 year old in in Nickelodeon and other ads uh, for baseball, like where'd you get your professional start and what's been your path to chief marketing officer at Vista? Professional starts at all relative term. I spent about 20 years at Nike, Nike side, a couple of years at Converse, which to me, I, I started working for Nike summer after my senior year in high school, started helping with a few projects and then Stayed with that a couple internships there, summer of 99, summer of 2000, in basketball, sports marketing. But really, I look at the time period that I was in Athens, Georgia, at the University of Georgia, where it was just a kind of hot house of doing interesting, fun things that I could look back and say were probably my professional start, but at the time just seemed like fun things. Working at the college radio station, figuring out how to get people to tune into our show, like figuring out how to put together broadcasts for spring football games and figuring out what promotions and interviews you needed to get for it. And like figuring out what giveaways would get people to tune in to your broadcast, working in the athletic department. Obviously it's a professional experience, but being part of the athletic department where it's like our goal is to figure out how to get students to go to games. It was just fun things working at the 40 watt club and figuring out how to get people to go and watch bands every night and how to make the concert calendar and what bands I was an assistant booking agent and kind of miscellaneous fill out the writer person and like figure out which band would make sense as an opener to get an extra 20 people in the crowd. And all of those things slowly and steadily were this somewhat entrepreneurial foundation started worked for a few record labels in Athens, started my own record label with my roommates where you're figuring out how do you print stickers? How do you make CDs? How do you convince bands to sign them? How do you do radio promotion? Who actually will care about these things? And then that kind of led to an opportunity with Buena Vista Pictures. One of my professors had gone to uh, become head of digital marketing at Buena Vista Pictures. This is like early uh, 2000, 2001. And he knew I was a nerd for the internet and movies. My uh, now wife and I had a movie talk show and he said, Hey, can you help me market our movies online? And of course I can. And so it was movies like some horror, some rough movies, some horrible movies, like just visiting a remake of a, it was a very successful French comedy, but did not translate well, but also a very sweeping summer epics like Pearl Harbor movies, like sweet home, Alabama, but also like personal joy, like things like getting to work on Royal Tenenbaums and trying to remember explaining, oh, there's these things called weblogs. We should debut the trailer to this weblog, the morning news. And again, I knew all those things were work, but at no point were my hobbies as much as they were work. 
But to me, the learnings from those still shape the way that I think about marketing every single day and the importance of community and how really truly understanding the universe of your audience and persistent belief that everything will change. Everything is going to constantly evolve. And I look back at that time where you look at the movie industry now and you can't imagine a world where focused on online fandom and things like Comic-Con's entire existence is around online fandom. In 2001, that wasn't the case at all. And the idea of debuting a trailer online or a one sheet or bringing an online film critic to a set just sounded crazy. But I think that's something that from you just can see like the inevitability of the inevitability of things evolving, but also uniquely staying the same. Finding an audience is an evergreen thing. It's just a ways you could find them is way more interesting year over year. I love that. I love the student media experience, the radio station. I also worked at the student newspaper at NC State. So I should say go dogs for you. We won the national championship. It was as sir it was an awesome moment. It's crazy. 41 years is a long time in between national championships, but there's plenty of schools like NC State that like I don't know if NC State's gonna win a champion national championship for a very long time, my apologies. But for Georgia to be constantly in the running for a really long time and to finally win it, it's a surreal feeling. I'm cheering for you in NC State. You always have Jimmy V. Yeah, I know. I know. I feel like you have to go back to the 80s to get anything good. But yes, it's like having a it's like being a Red Sox fan before the World Series before the uh, curse of the Bambino was gone. But yes, let's talk about Vista a little bit. Most people, I think, would know the name Vista Print. And then you've also been on an acquisition spree. But tell me a little bit about like, how do you describe what the company does? And who do you do it for? At Vista, our goal is to be the design and marketing partner for every small business in the world. And that is something where Vista Print has been around for 25 plus years, serves 10 million plus small businesses around the world each year. And what we realized over time was that people, obviously, there's so many people that know Vista Print and so many customers. And we would go and talk to different, you would talk to an agency like, we knew we were real when we made our business cards with you. Or I would check in at a building for a meeting and you'd be like, I'm from Vista Print. And the security guard would be like, ah. Oh, I have this, I also drive a, do a car service and I use Vistaprint. I love you all. But you realized was the opportunity was there for so many small businesses to help them be that, to help be that design and marketing partner versus just their printer. They're already coming to us to help them bring their identity to life, to help them get something in their hands and make them feel legitimate, credible, and real. But they also had needs for a website, they had needs for a logo, they had needs for things for, the, for their employees to wear, they had needs for promotional items. And by just focusing on business cards and other like flat printed items like postcards or posters, it's a very valuable business for a small business. But to some extent, we, there was so much more we could do to help them succeed. And that's why we made this shift to becoming... Vista. Over the last two years during the pandemic, we bought 99 designs out of Melbourne. Uh, amazing team. Super lucky to work with them every day. I actually have met one of the people from 99 designs in person now at this point, which is an exciting thing post pandemic. I get to meet a few more in a few weeks. But 99 designs is 100,000 designers around the world who are amazing. Each of them, their own small business in some regard. But the idea that all of a sudden, if you wanted to go and make a logo for your podcast, 99designs has absolute world-class designers who could come up with the best logos possible for it and help you see in context of what would it mean on a mug versus on a thermos versus on your website. And that kind of takes the next click that's like, well, hey, it's not enough for us just to go and make the logo. We also need to be able to go and make the social media kit for you. So that you could go and promote what makes your business uniquely your business. So in October of last year, we bought Crello and Deposit Photos, who we have since turned into Vista Create. Vista Create is a social media management software with a, just this incredibly simple design studio with millions of customers around the world. So now all of a sudden, we have Vista Print as a signature service, 99designs by Vista as a signature service. Vista Create is a signature service. And one of the things we're rolling out right now, as well as a partnership with Wix, we'll be helping get uh, Wix in the hands of small businesses around the world and really how we commingle those design solutions to be able to be that full design and marketing partner for small businesses. There's so much more we can do. We add constantly adding in new products 
from t-shirts to hoodies to merchandise. But essentially, when you think about from a print standpoint or design standpoint or digital standpoint, we've got that perfect solution for what your needs are. And that really is where the switch to becoming Vista has come in for us is just this incredible importance of making people understand like we can be your partner for everything design and marketing wise. And if we're able to do that and increase the odds of small businesses being successful, then the world will be a better place. Small businesses will have a greater chance to thrive. The world will be more unique and interesting. And you as a small business owner have a greater chance of living your dream. And I think that's the journey we're on at Vista and excited for it, but it's a unique adventure every day. Yeah. Yeah. Pulling all of those different pieces together, it does beg the question around like, how do you take a customer relationship that maybe came in through one of those doors and help them, ex- you know, understand the full breadth of services that you have? So like, how are you thinking about building those customer relationships? It's something where so much of it comes down to having amazing product and service. If you have amazing product and service, great customer care teams, great physical product selection, great design tools. But if you're able to actually do a fantastic job of serving that customer, it earns you the opportunity to be able to offer them up to other things that might be of value to them. And so much of that is providing the right context, the right understanding of what the right solution is for a baker in Berlin versus a gym owner in Chicago versus a podcast host somewhere in the podcast world. And I assume you don't have a brick and mortar location and you probably don't need coffee cups. But the idea of having social media templates might be the perfect thing you want to be able to go and promote each of the podcasts you're going to go and make. And so I think truly understanding the unique need of each small business owner and how do you deliver that perfect solution? Again, that gym needs towels with her logo on it, that gym needs mats with her logo on it, that gym needs great sport-inspired t-shirts for that, cus- that their community could buy. It needs all these different things that are very different than a florist who needs the a gorgeous paper wrap with her logo on it or whatever the various use cases might be. And I think that's so much of our job is really trying to make sure we're able to deliver that solution across, again, that print digital design spectrum, knowing that design is a big unifier of it. But I think it also is like for the existing business, it's introducing them to our new offerings and earning more and more of that relationship. For a new small business, we look at it as an opportunity for us to really truly help increase the odds of someone getting to day one of that business. Day minus 100 is filled with ambiguity and so much things that have to get done And the more we can do to remove the friction and try to increase that odds of getting to success, the more we are that partner for a small business. And I think that's something that what an existing small business needs versus a new small business, what they need is similar, but slightly different. And that one is a bigger blank canvas of needs and one understands how their business works because they're just further along in the journey. And so I think The opportunity is there for us to reposition ourselves to that existing business. But for the new business, so much of it is about really truly being that partner from day one. As you're thinking about your go-to-market activity and how you're going to get the word out, so to speak, about what you guys are doing. I've been a small business owner. I've probably started or been involved in nine businesses now, including like little retail businesses or my podcast as another example and many other things. But I used to always know that I would count on it coupon code or a discount code from Vista Print to get my next round of business cards. And it looks like not that's going away, but that you're having a strategic shift towards thinking about partnerships as a way to create brand awareness, maybe brand affinity. Tell me a little bit about that shift that's underway. It's about a holistic portfolio. I think our goal is to be able to provide everyday fair prices to our customers, to be able to provide great design solutions for our customers and really, truly, again, deliver them an experience that makes their life easier, increases their odds of making great products. And to me, like that is something that people should be able to depend on consistently every day and not have to wait for when a discount code comes down as if now is the time to go and work on your business. I think that's something we're constantly working on and finding that right balance. But part of it as well for us is just continually trying to be a partner to small business. And so almost everything we do is about how do we help 
share our spotlight with small business. And so when we think about the stories we tell on social, we want those stories to be about small businesses where we've been able to help. And I think that's something where the ability for us to really truly be able to partner closely, share that spotlight and develop these ambassador type relationships. We've got a hundred plus companies now at this point that are part of our ambassador program that our teams talk to about their unique needs, that they're helping create amazing products on Vista. We're telling their stories in commercials and social and email. And that notion that it really becomes a virtuous uh, cycle to a large extent. If you're a great Vista customer, we want to continue to give you opportunities to shine a light on the awesomeness you bring and help share that to the world. And I think it's something that I look at it as almost building brick by brick this house. And each brick in itself is not the, is not is singularly impactful. But the more you stack them and mortar them together, it becomes this incredibly stable, massive structure. And to me, that's every relationship we have with every small business is the critical thing the critical brick to build this wall, to build this house. And I think that's something that, again, we sat in a meeting two weeks ago where our community ambassador team was just sharing stories. And we have one tomorrow where three of the ambassadors will talk to 400 of our employees. And it was one of the most fun hours we've had because it was just fun to hear the stories of small businesses and the unique challenges they have, but also seeing them be like, oh my God, that's a great idea. Cross-pollinating ideas and all of those things over time in my mind, are the things that really, truly make brands that people love. That doesn't mean you don't need to have great TV advertising. But when you go do that great TV advertising, ideally, the small businesses that are there, it's a major moment for them. We should go to things like ComplexCon and have a presence. But we need to go there with our small businesses. You've had some high-profile partnerships as well. And I I applaud your efforts because as you're moving essentially from – transactions, I need a design, I need to print something to moments that matter for them and is almost prove that successful business in many, you know, the artifacts of successful business, which is interesting. It actually gave me goosebumps as I just said that. But you've got some other high profile sponsorships, but one in particular I wanted you to talk a little bit about is with Umberto Leone, the Chifa restaurant. And that's a pretty special partnership to us. Umberto Leone is one of the world's most inspiring creative directors from a fashion standpoint. He co-founder of the brand opening ceremony, which is a massively influential brand and just a world renowned creative director that he wanted to move to LA and start a family restaurant. And his mom had owned or his family had owned a restaurant in Peru before they moved to LA uh, in the seventies. That was called Chifa. That was a Chinese Peruvian restaurant and it was their dream to reopen that restaurant. They, so they reopened that restaurant in Eagle Rock. And again, Umberto is this world-renowned creative director in the fashion industry. And he had everything in his fingertips in the fashion industry from a production standpoint. And we opened this restaurant. He had all these hopes and dreams and was looking for a partner that could help play that similar role of being able to help make his dreams of merch come to life and everything the restaurant being shoppable. But at its core, it's a family story of it's his family's recipes being brought to life in this incredibly designed for an unbelievable restaurant in LA. And he wanted to make it so that people were able to take purchase memories from those events, from their, their meals there, be it a sweatshirt, a bucket hat, a tote bag, chopsticks, matchsticks. And through a mutual friend, he reached out to us and wanted to see how we could partner. I mean, he obviously was familiar with Vistaprint and didn't at that time didn't realize all the other things we could offer up. And so our community team I worked hand in hand with Umberto over the last few months to help build out his merchandise collection and tell the story of this small bit of Chifa and, this classic small business story. And I think that's what's so exciting is the opportunity to really truly help these things become signature defining parts of a city. I had a friend that was in LA last week from Brooklyn and they had read an article on Chifa in the New York times two weeks before, and they wanted to go to Chifa and they sent me a picture of his two kids wearing the Chifa hoodies that we made with Chifa. And to me, that's where our job is to develop those relationships over and over, have these long lasting, meaningful relationships. And we'll tell the story of Chifa in many different ways ahead because it's such an amazing partner. We'll continue to partner with Umberto, but our goal is thousands of relationships like that around the world 
that hopefully can help other small businesses understand what helps them differentiate themselves and gives them a greater chance of success. And how do we begin to scale those offerings to everyone? And I think that's the the power of some of these partnerships is to become that testing ground for us to export success. I mean, I'll talk about the Celtics for a second. The Celtics were our first major partnership and we could have taken the approach of, hey, let's go do 10 sports marketing partnerships and do a little bit of this in San Diego and a little bit of this in San Antonio and a little bit of this in Chicago and we'll see which ones worked. But instead we said, no, we're going to go all in with the Celtics. At the time we didn't switch to remote first and so Boston was our US home and we're like, it's a great incubator for us there, a timeless, iconic franchise with the most iconic jerseys in sports, the most passionate fan base that captivates an entire region and has massive nationwide and global appeal. And they really became this, again, this incubator for us where we're able to develop programs like Small Business of the Game and have to re- reverse engineer. What does it mean? Hey, if we know we want to honor a small business each game. How do we develop relationships where we have a constant flow of great small businesses to be honored? How do we figure out if we want to be deep in a community together? How do we give grants? What does it mean to have a grant program? What does it mean to actually be a partner day in, day out with these small businesses? Well, those learnings from the Celtics, we were able to export to the now Washington Commanders and did small business of the game with the Washington Commanders last year and partner with them on a lot of small business market after Thanksgiving last year, which was incredibly successful. We take those same foundations from the Washington Commanders and from the Celtics And we apply it to a partnership like with Liverpool FC, where now last week, there is the first small business in the match at Liverpool, where it's a small business in Liverpool being honored on a signage on pitch and getting a a note where you just, this is a moment that this person will remember forever. It's Liverpool and they're the small business of the match. And to me, that's the, this, uh, this opportunity for us to continually incubate what it means to be a partner and cross-pollinate those learnings and continually export that success. And But so much of it is about trying to make sure we can help that small business and scale the way we help. If you can help one business and build that into 10 and build it into 100 and build it into 1,000, eventually we think that a lot of those things can be valuable to help every single small business in the world. As you describe all of these partnerships in the Celtics one, as you went into detail, building out <laughs> to your point, you're not only building out relationships brick by brick, but you're building out what it means to be a partner and what your partnership program and totality looks like from the grant giving to highlighting the small businesses, having a pipeline of small businesses that you can highlight <laughs> to many, many, many other things that you just rattled off. I would really love, and I'm sure most people listening would love to hear how you think about what makes a successful partnership? I think a lot of it comes down to knowing what your scoreboard is and to have the time to actually play out the full game. For us, we know that ultimately we have to be an incredibly trusted partner that you're proud to use. And that takes time. But it's also a lot of it is about understanding that today you might not be starting a new small business. But in three years, you might be. And that the reason that we might be your first choice two and a half years from now is because of something awesome we did with Complex or an article you saw in the New York Times or a thing we did with Create and Cultivate or with Refinery29 or the 99 Days of Design program with Claim of Stories. But so much of it is creating high impact, meaningful cultural connections that help give context to the more mass communication that might happen or the performance marketing that might kick in of an Instagram ad and really trying to, I have to call it almost the triad of connections. Like that first connection might happen today. The next one might happen in 18 months and the next one after that might happen 24 months from today, but they all are stacking that bricks in those relationships that lead to someone becoming the partner of choice for a small business. And I think, That if the first time someone is discovering us is in search results, then you end up having to compete on things that are more commodity versus truly hearing how much value we could deliver for a small business. And to me, that's where like having that scoreboard lets us understand, is this choice we're going to make, if it's successful, this one pass connect to another pass, which connects to another pass, those things thread together into something that is a successful play for us. And 
I think trying to have that long-term scoreboard and really trying to have a great brand architecture and an understanding of where you want to go three years from now as a company so that you're able to reverse engineer any decisions you have to make through the lens of, well, let's get us closer to where we want to be in three years. There's always calls like, was this, did this partner work? How do you work with them? Was it the right value investment wise? But I look from a portfolio standpoint, it's always, uh, it is about the portfolio and the sequence of touches coming together. It's not about any one individual. If it's too much of thinking like they, this one partnership is going to unlock everything. I don't think that's how marketing works for mo- I, I think it's a series of connections over time that lead to the moment where all of a sudden you've gone from thinking about starting the small business to I'm going to start this small business. And of course, my first stop is Vista because of course, Vista is synonymous with being a partner in a small business. You have to do those things over and over to be able to earn that connection and to and, and see the compounding of the results. The end result, maybe I'm going back to your music, your you know, promoting music days, but the end result, if you've done it well and you've built this entire infrastructure is it creates this wall of sound <laughs> that emanates the brand so that you're constantly in the relevant. And that's the thing. It's like, think about of this imaginary room, if you will. Everything in this room feels like Vista, but if you zoom into one corner... It might feel like we exist to serve bakers in Berlin. If you zoom in on another corner, we exist to serve design forward restaurants in around the world. And if you zoom into another corner, we exist to serve e-commerce companies that need great packaging solutions. And what's important though, is that true notion of centric mindset and understanding what makes the brand uniquely the brand is something that allows that wall of sound to become pet sounds to talk about amazing achievements in the wall of sound genres. This has been good. This, I, I, I love how you're thinking about marketing. I like how you're building it on these partnerships to create not only a brand story for yourself, but a story for all the people that you serve in the community that you're building as well. I'd love to switch gears and get to know you a little bit more. We know you've, your career trajectory, where you've been, you were at Nike for so long, but I'm curious, this question I love asking everyone that comes on the show is, has there been an experience in your past that defines or makes up who you are today? You know, I think my time in Athens was a unique melting pot of the things that really still hold true today. It was a unique time to be there, not to go to too much music nerddom, but like 96 to 2002, living in Athens, Georgia, you had... Nutramilk Hotel, Olivia Trimmer Control of Montreal, Danger Mouse was a DJ at our college radio station then, you had Vic Chestnut, you had Jennifer Nettles was living there then, like John Mayer lived in Atlanta, was playing, opening for like any band, uh, taking any gig at that point, REM had moved back to town, everyone had a record label, you had massive, unbelievable sports in for a sports scene, you had Atlanta down the road with a great era for sports for them at that point. You'd outcast in Atlanta. Like you just had kind of this perfect storm. And it combined that with, from a film standpoint, again, I had a film talk show then. And it was an amazing era. 1999 was the best years for movies ever. And so I look at that time and that particular time frame, where I think it doesn't take much like to go and make an incredible impact on the world. If you believe that what you're doing can actually truly be impactful on the world and or that you have a unique point of view. And I think that's something where that era was so unique. Then we moved to Portland and Portland was just as interesting. Then it was small business heaven. You had Nike just thriving and growing, but on just downtown was ever was a thousand food carts going up and everyone had a small business that they were starting and all these creative agencies. So it was just a unique time where you're like, is this what life is like for always? Is you have amazing bands everywhere you go to and amazing small businesses and unique neighborhoods. And I feel like we were super spoiled for my wife Tiffany and I were super spoiled for that time frame. We were actually joking about the other day, like when we were in Athens, we had free movies, free concerts, and free sporting events. We were 20 years old. And it didn't get much better than that. But again, it wasn't about it was about how much 
excitement was being generated from a creativity standpoint at those times in those cities as well. If you were starting this journey all over again, what, what would you tell your younger self? I feel be patient is the wrong thing, but that timing really matters. A lot of things we worked on were just the best idea ever at the worst possible time. And I see things we worked on that completely and totally flop. They're multi-billion dollar companies now that it didn't mean, and I, my biggest advice I always give to people is like, never get rid of your cutting room floor because the idea you had four years ago might be the perfect idea for five years from that, from then, but it was just too far ahead four years ago. It doesn't mean the actual idea is wrong. It just means it might have the wrong timing. Social media was somewhat inevitable, but until I very clearly would credit Kevin Durant and Harrison Barnes as the two basketball players who truly were the first basketball players to 100% get social media and digital. I remember Harrison Barnes committed to UNC via Skype and Kevin Durant was at Texas and have a, was just super active on MySpace. And moment in time where like they were the first two players that I re distinctly remember where you didn't have to explain to them what some of these things were. And not because other players before them weren't incredibly smart, more smart. It's just college had changed in that time. High school changed in those two years. All of a sudden, yeah, of course, Kevin Durant had a MySpace page. He was 18 years old. Every 18-year-old had a MySpace page. So all of a sudden, an idea that three years earlier might have sounded incredibly complicated now was just an easy thing to say to KD to go do, to see if KD wanted to do. And I remember I was on a panel in like 2000 and like social media week, something or other. I remember saying like Kevin Durant's the first athlete that really is his own brand manager in a lot of ways. Because he was so active on social so early on. And now, obviously, LeBron have caught up in such massive, amazing ways. And so much of that ability to be comfortable, you could go and do anything, ties back to, in a lot of cases, his digital empowerment. And I think if I go back to the advice to younger self, it's, yeah, you might have known all those things were going to happen. But until they happen, it doesn't mean it's going to work. And... I think that's one of the things where if you only spend two years at a company or three years at a company, you may be like, that company doesn't get it. They don't understand where the things are going. But really, they might just understand we're in this for the long haul. And it's more important to do it right than to do it fast sometimes. There's so much going on. Is there anything you're trying to learn more about these days or you think marketers should be learning more about? Web3 is something that like you'll hear referred to other ways, metaverse, NFT, so on and so forth. But like the notion of what Web2 was, and distinctly, I remember going to a Web2 conference in 2003 and this notion of like this incredibly connected, socially driven world and things like when you Craigslist and Google Maps mashed up into an apartment hunting site as these amazing moments in time that just opened up this world of possibilities of data coming together with a social layer to it in uniquely interesting ways. I think Web3 is a similar moment for the world. But again, back to timing. Is that going to change? Yes. Everything that has a Web2 version will have a Web3 version. Will that happen this year? In no way, shape, or form. It might be five years. It might be 10 years. It might be 15 years. But the idea that there is a sense of community, things like DAOs, things like the what blockchain offers from this notion of the record transaction that gives a sense of this distributed ownership is incredibly interesting. And some of the most exciting communities I see, FWB, where they did a pre-sale on a, on a festival they're having in California in August via exclusive mint of you at 75 of their coins and pre-selling the NFT and announced via their Discord and their Twitter feed. And or you see Gary Vandershack doing like V Friends, which leads to VCon and all these amazing, interesting events. What does it mean for a small business owner? Not a ton yet, but over the next three years, five years, definitively, it will mean a ton. And I think that applies for every single company in the same way that like no one could say, what made Web2 interesting, Facebook and Instagram, Twitter, like unique data coming together, like those things impacted every company. But it's all in pursuit of doing more awesome, rad things for customers and communities. And I think that's something where 
don't know. I always say to people, no one's ever made a bad investment learning about the future. Like, it just helps you make a decision. It helps you control your your destiny a little bit more. And so, I don't know. I'm really excited for it. I think I think everyone should spend time with it. But there's so many different things. I think, in general, nerding out on things is always important. So, uh, curious, we've talked about so many brands that you've worked on personally. Are there, like, brands or companies or causes that you follow you think other people should be taking notice of? There's so many that are so interesting. I'm just looking across my desk. Like, I liquid death as a water in a can, but it's become so much more of just every piece of communication they put out so interesting. Their ability to just constantly expand their universe bit by bit is interesting to me. What Marvel is, what Disney Plus has done with the Marvel universe has been just amazing to watch. Like, it's just unbelievable to see what we was tentpole movies now turn into just like core anchoring memories for people. It's just, it's exciting. I'm a nerd for streetwear. Like, I look at how Supreme consistently reinvents himself on a season over season or drop over drop basis weekly. And it's always impressive. Palace is another company that kind of falls into that same camp where I rarely ever don't find something interesting there. But you also see it in how the NBA consistently evolves and how they've embraced social media in so many different unique, interesting ways and how the players have embraced these platforms. I mean, I could have for every sport, but I don't, I just think that there's, Endless amounts of things that are interesting. I think go puff because I think we're none of us are alone. The notion of transference is really interesting. Like when you can get anything from Amazon Prime in two days, the expectation bar rises. When you can get groceries delivered in 15 minutes, it's not that people expect you to deliver your custom printed product in 15 minutes, but they definitely probably expect it faster than it was expected to be delivered 15 years ago. And I think it's just important to understand that like inevitably – Companies might compare themselves to their competitors, but customers compare everything in their life to everything in their life. And so the bar of awesomeness is not your closest competitor. Your bar of awesomeness is what people find to be awesome in their everyday life. So true. I was just talking to somebody actually about that very topic that like no longer are our expectations as humans confined to these little boxes that we play business games in. A bad experience is a bad experience. It doesn't matter if I'm getting my coat or getting my coffee. We know what good experiences are. We know what bad experiences are. Last question for you. What do you feel like is the largest opportunity or threat facing marketers? Impatience is something that it's a risk. Like things take time. And everything looks like an overnight success, but rarely are things actually an overnight success. A lot of things take time to get a string together that the connections. And I think increasingly from a sure marketing standpoint, there's some things that are incredibly measurable and there's other things that are very difficult to measure. And just because one's incredibly measurable doesn't mean it's more valuable than a thing that's very, that's difficult to measure. And I think that's constantly going to be tough because the things that are measurable will only become more measurable. And yeah, you could get into conversations about what does it mean when Apple does this or privacy this or but inevitably there's just a massive ecosystem around measurable things that everyone I think implies means that those are the right things to do. But some absolutely unbelievable brands were built with things that are incredibly unmeasurable. And I think that was just a constant balancing act. And I think in a lot of cases, a lot of the things that take time are a little more black boxed from how do they work for companies? Whereas like, it's easy to find case studies on how someone saw a fill in the blank lift from this campaign using this technology. And it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just a thing that I think everyone has to balance is what is that wall of sound that's going to make sense for you? And what is that, that, magical ratio that's right for your company and on what time frame. And just when you think you have it figured out, you need to start it all over and figure it all out again. And I think that's where beginning to things like, what's your TikTok strategy? If I were to take you in a time machine to five years ago and ask you what your TikTok strategy is, you'd be like, sorry, what? Musically? No, no, no. TikTok. It's the thing that's going to replace it. What's your strategy for it? And so you can have the best planning possible And then all of a sudden, TikTok emerges. Well, then all of a sudden, NFTs emerge. 
And you could sit there and be like, I'm going to slow play this and see what the plan is going to be over the next couple of years for it, which is great patience wise. But your competitors might not. Maybe they're going to be like, oh, we are going to be the company that is the most connected, famous, native to TikTok company ever. And then all of a sudden, your amazing, majestic plan has been like the world changed on you. And I think that's something where that's, imp- but that's where I would say it's really important for everyone, not just marketers, but like companies in general. It's like, what do you want the world to look like in three years? What do you want it to look like in five years? And how are you going to reverse engineer what it's going to take to get there? The destination won't change for you. If you know what you want to be in three years, that destination shouldn't change. But the route, similar to Waze, the route can always reroute you. But that destination very rarely changes. If you put into work. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with support from my team and podcast editors, sound engineers, and writers at Share Your Genius. Find them at shareyourgenius.com. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners. You can contact me on marketingtodaypodcast.com. There, you will also find complete show notes, links to what was discussed in the episode today, and you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.